We have a great relationship with the Keck Center for Behavioral Biology over at NC State. And thanks to this relationship, sometimes we get guests for our cafe that come from far away. They would have exceeded our budget, but our good, deep-pocketed friends, they bring these fancy people in. I don't mean, yes, fancy, exactly. And... uh I didn't, I almost thought you were going to take that as like an insult that I called you fancy or something, but it's actually, yeah. Um, she comes to us from Yale University where she's in the Department of Psychiatry. She's a neuroscientist and her research to fit in with Brain Awareness Week uh, focuses on nicotine addiction. So you already know that because that's why you're all here. So uh, how about a nice round of applause for Dr. Marina Pachotto? Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for coming out. I hope all of you got to hold a brain. I hold mine. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you today about uh, smoking, but particularly about nicotine. And there are 4,000 constituents at least in tobacco, but we know that there is one that if you take it out, even if you don't tell anyone, they will stop smoking. So nicotine is the primary component of tobacco that keeps people smoking. Is there anyone here who has ever smoked, ever? Is there anyone here who has, this is a new question for me, is there anyone here who has ever vaped? Fewer, but uh, there, I actually, when I ask this question in the United States, there are a lot of people who I am sure are afraid to put up their hands when I ask this question in Europe, people are like, yeah. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about what are the molecules in the brain that make us start and keep smoking. And I'm gonna to talk to you about other things that make people continue to smoke in addition to uh, the fact that it is an addictive substance that keeps us coming back for more. So first of all, here's the problem. We actually know a lot about the molecules in the, in the brain that nicotine sticks to and activates. And they are a family of proteins called the nicotine receptors, nicotinic receptors. And they were not evolved in order for us to roll up a plant, set it on fire, and put it in our face. These are receptors for the endogenous normal neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is useful, right? We use it at our neuromuscular junction. The signals that our nerves send to our muscles acetylcholine nicotine receptors. And in our brains, these nicotine receptors are important for attention, they're important for mood, they're important for sleep, and yet here is a set of molecules that have been hijacked by a molecule in plants that in fact is used as an insecticide. So something interesting about nicotine, the reason that nicotine is in the leaves of tobacco is to protect against insects who use these same nicotine receptors to uh, process all of their signals in their insect brains as well. So nicotine comes in, fries their insect brains, and that's why these plants have nicotine in their leaves. All right, so the problem, we've got this big family of molecules. You can see the evolutionary tree of these nicotine receptors there, lots of them, and they combine together. We also know that these nicotine receptors are in the brain in uh, many different patterns. They're in almost every cell in the brain, and they, uh, that large family is expressed in different subsets of nerve cells in the brain, different patterns. They're expressed very early in development of the brain. And we also know from talking to smokers that there are a lot of reasons that they smoke. And if you, any of you talk to uh, people in your lives who have ever smoked, they might say, I like it, it feels good. Or they might say, I smoke when I wanna do something complicated, when I wanna focus my attention. Or I smoke when I don't feel very happy or when I uh, feel anxious. All of those reasons are thought to be maybe psychology, but when you think about the molecules in the brain that transduce the signals of nicotine, you realize that in fact these are neurobiological effects of this family of nicotine receptors that are normally processing signals in your brain. So these are the molecules, that's a diagram there, and what they are is channels that go through the membrane of a cell, and particularly nerve cells in the brain, 
And when a molecule of nicotine binds to these receptors or when acetylcholine, the normal neurotransmitter, binds to these receptors, it opens up a hole in the membrane, ions, salt molecules flow into the cell that excites the neurons, the neurons fire, and a signal is sent from one cell to another. That's what they do, that's their job. They excite neurons on which they're expressed when nicotine or acetylcholine bind to them. What you can see on the side in blue is what the nicotine receptor and in the muscle looks like. We know a lot about it, its structure has been worked out in fine detail, and a lot of what we know about the structure of the family uh, in the other colors is based on what we know about that muscle receptor. It's five different individual subunits, that means individual molecules of the nicotine receptor arranged in a barrel with that hole, that channel through the membrane right in the middle. And nicotine binds at the interface between two neighboring subunits. So you remember that family tree? There are about 15 different subunits of the receptor. You can imagine that if they can combine in these different combinations of five individual subtypes, that the number of combinations of those subunits can be very, very large. In fact, there are some rules. So they don't, recomb they don't combine together randomly. And what you can see in green, reddish pink, and yellow is three examples of combinations that we know actually happen in uh, the, ma the mammal. So there's one family that is maybe the simplest family, the one that's easiest to understand, that has five of the same subunit all arranged in the same molecule. That's the green one. And that's called homomeric. It's all the same, homo, same. And on the bottom, you see two different kinds of combinations where you have to have at least one alpha and at least one beta to make a functional molecule. And those are called hetero receptors. So hetero, different. And the type on the bottom is the type that I'm gonna talk about today. And the reason that there are two colors is that there are two big families that are found in different parts of the brain and body. The yellow one is the kind that is expressed that's found throughout the brain in the broadest pattern of expression. The pink one is really important for the fight or flight response. So you know when there's something uh, dangerous in the environment, your heart rate starts going, you're, uh, you're ready to run, you're ready and alert against a, a predator, that's because the peripheral nervous system is activated and the peripheral nervous system uses that red receptor as its primary mode of communication. All of that said, that red one is also found in some pockets in the brain as well. All right, so that's the molecules we're talking about. Now that is an image of the human brain with a radio tracer that binds to the receptors that I was talking about, the heteroreceptors that are most widely expressed in the brain. Those heteroreceptors are expressed in the same pattern in pretty much all mammalian brains that we've looked at. And what you can see on that image is a brain that's this way, okay? So that blue part in the front is the front part of the brain. And that the, the brighter the color, the more of these nicotine receptors there are in the human brain. And so what we can look at in human brains is whether someone has more or fewer of those receptors, but we can also see whether they're occupied by nicotine. So a smoker would not have that pattern of expression because nicotine would compete away all of that tracer and you would see a pretty blank brain. But once someone quits, that nicotine slowly, slowly comes out of the brain and it takes seven to 10 days for that image to come back and look like what you see there on the screen. And that's pretty remarkable. So nicotine sticks around in your brain for at least seven to 10 days after you stop smoking. So why do people smoke? We know, we've known for a long time, it's really bad for you. It uh, is the number one still leading a preventable cause of death in the United States and around the world. And yet people continue to smoke and they may even wanna stop, but they keep going back to it. And of course the answer is that the nicotine in tobacco is an addictive substance and like other psychostimulants, and psychostimulants are amphetamine, cocaine, 
it drives ongoing smoking because it is what we call reinforcing. And that's just a term in behavior that means that when you have the nicotine, whatever you're doing, you want to do it again. You keep doing it. And we know a lot about the neurobiology of addiction and reward. So now I'm showing you sections through the brain with binding of markers for many different subtypes of the nicotine receptors. And if you look right in the middle, you see that dark mustache-shaped pattern? That is your dopamine cells. That is the dopamine neurons in the middle of the brain. I think probably many of you have heard about dopamine. It's been billed as the reward molecule. It is a neurotransmitter that when it's released, helps us make decisions. It helps us go on and do things that uh, are good for survival. So when you release dopamine, you want to do whatever it was you were doing again. So things like eating good food, uh, seeking a mate, maybe coming to a science cafe. Um, but what happens is that drugs of addiction hijack that system, and every single drug that is addictive in humans in some way affects that dopamine system. And we know, in fact, that nicotine is very good at affecting that system. So you see that mustache shape, it shows up in all of those patterns, in all of those panels, either very darkly, maybe faintly. And the reason is that nicotine is very good at stimulating these dopamine cells. So now I have my uh, cartoon of a brain. I'm more of a molecular biologist, so my brain is not that complicated. There are only two, three, four, five nerve cells in it. It's not... Not bad, I started with one. That's right. Oh. So what you see with DA there, the cell body that says DA, that is the dopamine cell, the dopamine neuron. And it has its cell body right in that mustache-shaped area called the ventral tegmental area. And it sends its process forward in the brain to a part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. And when dopamine comes out, out of those nerve cells in the nucleus accumbens, we know that it's going to be reinforcing. It's going to make us do whatever was happening when it comes out. But you see there are a lot of other cells around there modulating that neuron. ACH is acetylcholine. Normally, ACH, acetylcholine, stimulates those nicotine receptors and makes those dopamine neurons fire. It's important for natural rewards, and it's important for addiction. But those triangular shaped molecules that I've diagrammed mostly in blue, there's one in yellow, are a model of the nicotine receptors. And what you can see is that they're very good at making that whole circuit fire. They're on those cell bodies of the dopamine cells. They're also on the, what's called the terminals, the end of those dopamine neurons in the nucleus accumbens. They're even on nerve cells that impinge on those dopamine neurons and make them fire more. So at every step in that pathway, nicotine can come in and drive this circuit. It's good at getting dopamine cells to fire, and when they fire, it's good at making them spit out even more dopamine. So what we did was to try to figure out which of the very many of those 15 different nicotine receptors was important for making those dopamine neurons fire. It could have been that it was none of them. It could have been that it was some subset of them. And what I'm showing you here is an example of what happens when you take away one of those family members, just one. On the very top, what you see is a section where nicotine is radio-labeled, and it's sticking to the nicotine receptors on a normal brain. Can you guys see that? That's this panel up here. You probably, I can't point, sorry. It's the one that looks like the human brain, but now it's a brain that's this way, okay? Right next to it, there's something that's blank. That is nicotine binding at the lowest concentration in the brain of a mouse that no longer has one, the beta-2 subunit, one type of nicotine receptor. The tightest binding to nicotine is gone. And if you look at those spikes on the left-hand side of the, of the slide, what that is, is we have put a pipette onto a dopamine neuron, and we spritz nicotine on that dopamine neuron, and it fires. It's activated by nicotine. But underneath it, what you can see is the pattern is unchanged by nicotine, and that's because we've taken away that one type of nicotine receptor, and now these dopamine neurons are completely non-responsive 
to nicotine. And we can do that in many ways. That's diagrammed on this slide. I won't go through it. But what happens is that if you have a mouse that has that pattern of nicotine receptor, that is the one type gone, now when you measure its behavioral response to nicotine, it thinks nicotine is water. So normal mice, when we give them nicotine, will actually move around more. It's a little bit like cocaine and amphetamine. They're activated. They're stimulated. And so you can see in that panel on the left that normal mice, when they get nicotine, move. But if we give nicotine to the animals without beta-2, they're fine. They move around normally at, in, in most cases, but with nicotine, no change. The next middle panel, that's the white uh, background, is an example of what I call the bar office experiment. If I gave you the ability to come to a science cafe, drink a glass of wine, or you had to go back to your school or office and you had to sit there in your chair, and then on a Friday I got you to choose where would you like to be in the bar or in your office, the scientists might choose to be in the lab, that is true. However, many of us might go to the place where we received some reward, and that happens with animals as well. When they receive nicotine paired with a certain environment, they get trained to associate the environment with that nicotine, and then when given a choice, they will go and explore in that environment. But if you have a mouse without one of those nicotine receptors, the beta-2, they just explore equally in both sides of that, uh, of that test chamber. And finally, the real hallmark of addiction is Will a person or an animal work hard to get that substance, that drug? And so in humans, it's will you go pay a lot of money to get a pack of cigarettes? In animals, it's will you press a lever or poke your nose to get a shot of that drug? And what you can see is that animals will work. They'll push a lever. They'll uh, poke their nose to get nicotine normally. But without beta-2, not at all. They will just ignore it. It's not worth working for. So now we have one molecule that's important for all of the behavioral hallmarks in a mouse that are associated with addiction. And as a whole field, we have come together using pharmacology, using neuroscience, using molecular biology, and we've actually worked out all of the five subunits around that nicotine receptor that are important for, this, uh, for these behaviors. And we've worked out where in the brain they need to be and when development they need to be there and how they transduce that signal from this abused drug to neurobiology to behavior. So that's kind of cool. And so we now have a summary. Here is the subtype of nicotine receptor that we know is important for all of the behavioral hallmarks of addiction. And we actually know the exact nerve cells in which it needs to be expressed. But that's not the only reason that people smoke. And I'm just going to take one small example of another reason that people smoke. And that is that some people, and particularly uh, when we do surveys, not we, when uh, surveys are done, uh, people say that they are going to keep smoking and not quit because they're afraid to gain weight. I once gave a talk and uh, uh, a, a dad came up to me afterwards. He said, yeah, my son is on the wrestling team. He has to control his weight. He actually chooses to chew nicotine gum in order to control his weight. And certainly the most disturbing statistic is that in some surveys, the number one reason that teenage girls say that they start smoking is to control weight, which is really bad decision if any of you are thinking about it. Because the amount of weight is very tiny. It's two and a half kilograms. And it's not that it goes, uh, that you overshoot that very much if you quit. You just go back to you where you would have been if you weren't a smoker. It's a tiny amount. Little running would probably take care of that. So on average, smokers are about that two and a half kilograms uh, uh, lighter than non-smokers. And we can model this in mice again. So we can give mice nicotine every day. And what you can see is that a normal mouse continues to gain weight across its whole lifespan. By the way, humans too. So if you're gaining a little weight, it's okay. But if you give them nicotine, you actually bend that growth, growth curve. So they gain a little bit less weight. So what we wanted to know is, is this the same nicotine receptor that's important for addiction, for reinforcement? So we could do the same kinds of experiments. We could now look in a part of the brain where we know that appetite is, is uh, controlled, and that's the hypothalamus. It's a deep brain structure. 
And what's really exciting is in the last probably five to 10 years, there's been a, a lot of neurobiological studies that have shown that in this part of the hypothalamus, the arcuate nucleus, there are two kinds of nerve cells that are intermingled. And one is called the POMC neurons. And if you stimulate those POMC neurons, a hungry animal will stop eating. And the other co population are called the NPY neurons. Both of these are named after peptides that are in these uh, types of neurons. And if you stimulate the NPY neurons, a completely uh, full animal will voraciously go out and seek food. So we've got these two neurons that say, I'm hungry, go, use your energy to find calories. And another set of neurons that say, that's enough. You've eaten enough, now use your energy to do something else. So we thought maybe there are nicotine receptors on those satiety neurons, the POMC neurons, that say, maybe it's time to stop seeking calories, at least tweak them and decrease appetite. And what we found was in fact that is the case. If we, re if we look at those neurons in a slice of a brain, there are in fact nicotine receptors on them and nicotine can stimulate them. And if we isolate them the same way that I showed you in those dopamine neurons and we put a pipette on them and we record the, the response to nicotine, nicotine makes them more active and so do other drugs that stimulate nicotine receptors. So, are they the same nicotine receptors as the ones for the other behaviors? They are not. So what we did was in fact to use a method to take those autonomic ganglia, the fight or flight nicotine receptors, or the addiction receptors, and to decrease them in this part of the brain that controls appetite. We simply made uh, small molecules that would make less of these receptors in this brain area. And what you can see is that the first bars, the white bar is just a normal mouse eating a little bit of food. The black bar next to it is how much food that same normal mouse would eat if they had nicotine on board or a nicotine-like uh, molecule. Next to it, in the middle, is what happens when you give a mouse that doesn't have the addiction receptor in the hypothalamus. Looks normal. When you give it nicotine, it eats a little bit less food. The black bar is a little bit lower than the white bar, right? On the far right is what happens when you give nicotine to a mouse that has that fight or flight receptor gone in the hypothalamus. Now you give them nicotine, no change in food intake. It's exactly the same. So what we found is that here is a type of nicotine receptor that is distinct from the receptor that causes addiction, but it has a different location of action in the food center of the brain versus the reward center of the brain, and it's a different subtype, which means that we might be able to make medications that separate these two types uh, from each other. So here's our summary again. Here are the different families. That yellow one was the addiction receptor. We now know that this red family is important in the hypothalamus, the appetite center of the brain, for the ability of nicotine to change food intake, and we have a different location for its action. So just to sum up, this was our problem. We have a big population, a big family of molecules that can sense nicotine in the brain, but we can use pharmacology, we can use molecular biology to tease them out and to find out their function in different parts of the brain. They're expressed all over the brain, but we can be selective and find out exactly where in the brain each of these different family members exerts its effect to change behavior, and we can separate out those behaviors. So the good news is that as a field, and I've talked about my work, but it's also the work of many, many of my colleagues, and in fact, this is probably 100 years of research that has been boiled down into a very short talk. And this combination of molecular biology and pharmacology that is using drugs that are naturally available or have been synthesized has actually allowed us to make pretty good progress in dissecting out these molecules that are important for addiction and other behaviors. The challenge is that we still do not have medications that work in human to separate out these functions as carefully as we can with, uh, with uh, molecular biology in the mouse. So the challenge is to actually have really good chemistry so that we can make new medications that are more specific. 
And finally, our hope is that we could then make medications that separate out the many functions that nicotine uh, has in the brain. And perhaps rather than uh, having people who say, I'm not going to, to quit because I'm afraid of gaining weight, we can help them say, well, here, this medication might actually allow you to uh, quit smoking and not gain as much weight as you otherwise would. Or perhaps we can give medications, and there are some of these that exist, that mimic some of the rewarding effects of nicotine without being as powerful and allow you to change your behavior and slowly uh, stop smoking. So I want to give you an idea of the people who did this work. These are people who are uh, in my laboratory. And I want to thank you for your attention. I am really happy to answer any questions that you have on this or any other topic related to nicotine. All right. How about a nice round of applause for Dr. Marina Pachotto? And uh, so here's the way I know there's a lot of people who haven't been here before. Here's the way we do the Q&A. All of our programs stream live on YouTube and also uh, Livestream.com, another streaming video place. And they're available to watch later. They're archived there at the website at the uh, channel for the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Uh, but because of that, we want all the questions into the microphone. So Katie and I have microphones. Uh, get our attention. You might have to do it more than once. There's a lot of you. And so uh, we'll do our best to get around to you in the order you raise your hands. And um, questions could be about anything related to this. I'll, I'll kick us off with something. You mentioned we have these receptors in our brain and they aren't there for the chemicals that are in too, nicotine yeah. or any other drugs. Right. But we have here, these receptors in our brain for one reason, and it turns right. out there are all these plants all over the world that have various different effects, yeah. and they just happen to fit these receptors in our brains. It's no happen. coincidence. So how is it, not only that, it's like, how did we come to, we might never have discovered that the smoked leaves of that plant would have this effect, and yep. yet we did, and yet this, right. yeah, so that's such a weird. So, so let me start out with, we may never have uh, discovered that the smoked leaves of this plant worked in this way. Humans will try anything. <laughs> we know that we can do all sorts of crazy stuff, and then you get excited and you do it again, right? Yeah. So I, I think we would have discovered it. But what's really exciting about these uh, receptors is that they actually tell us a lot about the history of organisms that sense the environment. That family tree that I uh, showed again and again, that, that uh, branched tree, that's the mammal tree of these nicotine receptors. Pretty much anything that moves, pretty much anything that senses the environment has some kind of these nicotine receptors. So uh, little uh, worms that live in the soil, um, uh, nematodes, they have 40 of these. We have 15, they've got 40. And insects- you know what they don't have? What? Lighters. <laughs> <laughs> or thumbs. Yeah, or thumbs. Yeah. <laughs> the lighter breaks they, down real quick. They may, the have, they may have lighters, but they can't use them. <laughs> they don't have thumbs. And so- Even they have these receptors. They have these receptors, and in fact, they use them the way we use anything that makes us think and move. They really use these receptors as the central uh, fast, powerful neurotransmitter receptor in their brains. And that, as I said, is why tobacco plants have the nicotine in them, it's to fry these insect brains. Some We've repurposed the them. And things, if they have those receptors and they use them, but by using them you mean it's their internal system that something is released and has that effect. But That's right. they, like us, yep. without the technology of a right. lighter, seek out some external way to stimulate. Right. Those. In yeah. fact, the opposite. So uh, what's interesting is that insects have sort of inverted our systems. You know how I said that at the neuromuscular junction, we use these nicotine receptors and we use acetylcholine? Well, in fact, in their brains, they use nicotine receptors and acetylcholine the way we use another neurotransmitter called glutamate. It's not important what it's called. Nicotine is what's important. <laughs> and so they've inverted it so that it's not um, as um, it's not as inessential as it is for us. We we need it for movement, but we don't really need it in our brains. If we didn't have nicotine receptors, we'd be hampered but not dead. The nematodes would be dead, and so they don't find it rewarding. They find it lethal. Okay, <laughs> excellent. So. Uh, Get, get my attention, yeah. get Katie's attention. Yeah, uh, actually, you you uh, answered the question that I had, oh, but I have sorry. a second question. 
uh, which is on the, uh, the channels, the, the nicotine receptors, there are different levels that you showed, Laura, like pentagons. Yes. How do you find out what they are? How do you see what they are? What instruments do you use to find out? That's an outstanding question, and we use a lot of different uh, tools. So number one, we can do structure. So electron microscopy can actually show the structure of those receptors. And when I teach about them, I've got some really pretty pictures. Um, there's an organism called the torpedo electric fish. Now, the torpedo electric fish is a fish, but in its fins, it has these batteries that it has made from these nicotine receptors on one face of the cell and on the other face of the cell, a pump for the ions that flow through these nicotine receptors. And what happens is they're in a crystalline array. There's so many nicotine receptors that they're just like a, a, a floor tile. And so when they get prey, acetylcholine is released and the whole array opens at once and it zaps its prey with something like 40 volts or 400 volts, I forget, it's a four. Four. Uh, so what we know is that we can take that torpedo electric organ and put it in an electron microscope and actually see exquisitely the structure of these receptors. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. We can use chemical methods to examine their, um, the parts of the molecule that are functional. We can use the kinds of physiology that I showed you to put together different combinations and show what the different combinations do uh, in response to nicotine, in response to acetylcholine. We can find out about their structure by putting them into animals uh, in different patterns. So we use a huge number of tools to look at their structure and function. Sure. When a person takes a nicotine, um, do the receptors change in quantity? Yes. They do. Okay. And after the nicotine is removed, do the receptors heal themselves or does it not happen? Such a great question. So it's really uh, counterintuitive. Uh, you'd think that if you were getting a lot of nicotine in the brain that maybe you would decrease the number because there's so much nicotine. And in fact, in human brains, you double the number of nicotine receptors if you're a smoker. And we can mimic that even in cells with the nicotine receptors. If you put nicotine on them, uh, the number goes up. And in the uh, studies that I showed with the human brain imaging, you can somewhat determine how long it takes to get back to normal. So first you have to wash out the nicotine. It takes about one to two weeks. Then you can start imaging people repeatedly. And it turns out that it takes at least a month for the number of receptors to go back to normal. And that was uh, work done by my colleague, Julie Staley. And once they're back to normal, they do seem to be pretty much like a non-smoker. But it's probably a month is minimum. Hi, so I had a question about when people usually try to stop smoking, uh, they try to change their behavior, mm -hmm. avoid the cues, mm -hmm. exercise, do something else. And I was curious Look, if your studies you have shown, will that also affect the brain, the, the receptors? That is a terrific point, and this is true not just for nicotine, but for all drugs that are addictive. Uh, what happens is that the first thing that, that occurs is that the drug itself causes nicotine, uh, causes dopamine to be released, right? So that's directly rewarding. And then over time, there is an association with whatever's going on in the environment and the drug, so that now you don't need the drug. You just need to go into the environment where you usually get the drug and all of those cues will cause the dopamine neurons to fire on their own, and that will make you want the drug. And so that cue-induced change in behavior, which is learned, turns out to be something that nicotine receptors uh, do very, very well. So even more so than other drugs, it makes cues in your environment uh, drive your behavior even more. So you think about people who have a specific brand. When they see that brand, dopamine gets released in the brain, they want to reach for that package, right? So that's a very um, important reason that people relapse. They see those cues. What we know is that uh, the changes in the brain that occur because of that learning are extremely long-lasting. And so even when you have learned something new, which is, I do not want to smoke anymore, I don't smoke anymore, that is new learning and it doesn't erase the old learning. So there's a, a kind of learning called extinction learning. 
That is, if every time I came in here I got a cigarette, I would learn in here this predicts a cigarette. I can then quit and learn a new thing. That is, coming in here does not give me any cigarettes. Over time, I will learn that. But it's very specific to a place. So if I learn that here, I might go into another place where I used to smoke. Let's say I change jobs and I go into the old office where I used to smoke. I didn't do any extinction learning there. I didn't do new learning. All of those circuits in the brain are still there that drive dopamine, and I might relapse when I go into that new environment. And there's some very interesting information about that context around addiction. In the Vietnam War, there was a very high level of heroin addiction among the soldiers who fought in Vietnam. The vast majority of those soldiers came back to the United States and never used the drugs again. Some people, unfortunately, continued to uh, use heroin, and, and obviously, uh, for them, the addiction was not site-specific. But for many of the others, the context where they used to use the drug had completely changed. They may not even have had the friends who they used to use the, the drugs with, and of course, they didn't have the stress of war. And stress is another precipitating uh, stimulus for ongoing addiction. So that very site-specific learning is uh, a, an important reason that addicts must uh, avoid contexts where they usually get the drug, and why uh, the learning, uh, uh, the new learning of extinction has to be done more broadly than just in one location, like say in a hospital. Kimani, my question is kind of similar. Um, since smell is such a powerful sensory um, organ, mm -hmm. What, if someone were to just smell the secondhand smoke, would it bring back and uh, release those dopamine senses? It sure body? would. It's a really powerful cue. And um, smokers also talk about the taste um, being a, a very important component and the harshness in the throat. All of those sensory cues, I, I talked sort of about visual cues for the most part, but every one of those sensory cues is very important to driving uh, the seeking, the, the, the desire for the drug. Yeah. Um, I still remember smoking the two filters of Viceroy when I was 10. Uh -huh. What does it take to induce the addiction of nicotine? Right. So that's a great question. I actually had a neighbor uh, who I was talking to. And he, he had quit smoking 40 years ago. He, he, he made sure his children weren't listening, and he said, I still dream about it. So it is a very potent memory that, that comes back. It's, uh, it, it's something that's hard to, to erase. So what does it take to become addicted? You said 10. 10 is a little bit early. Right. Lucky for you. That's good. Uh, most people who begin smoking and become addicted start as adolescents. And the reason is that the adolescent brain is made to learn. It's made to make new associations, it's made to encode your environment, and therefore it is extremely susceptible to new learning, like learning related to addiction. The adolescent brain is also wired to seek out new experience, to take risks, and to try new things, like addictive substances. And so most people who start smoking during adolescence actually start out of a sense of exploration, and I was actually at a panel of kids who were maybe 18, and said that, every one of them said, I started because I thought I could stop at any time, and then uh, I was about 15, and when I got to be 18, I wanted to stop, and actually all of a sudden discovered I could not. And there are a lot of very good studies in, in kids showing that the process of addiction is very different. So uh, whereas uh, adult smokers tend to smoke every day, they smoke a fair amount. There are some people who only smoke on weekends called chippers who are very interesting. Um, <laughs> For the most part, adults are regular smokers, but adolescents can smoke very rarely, and when they do smoke, they exhibit many of the behavioral hallmarks of addiction uh, in a way that adults do not. And uh, so what happens to the brain when you get addicted? Well, some people are very sensitive to the plasticity that allows cues in the environment to take over their behavior. Some people are risk takers. Some people are very sensitive to stress in the environment. Some people may simply have a genetic profile that predisposes them to use uh, drugs of abuse. Other people may have had early life stressors, like a very difficult environment. Every one of those things makes each one of us differently sensitive to the addictive properties of nicotine. 
So when I hear one person say, well, I, I just decided to stop smoking, I think, good for you. That's great. It's not because your willpower is any less good than person over here who's tried to quit and relapsed. It's that your neurobiology constrains your willpower in a different way from the neurobiology of the person who is driven to continue smoking. I think of this as, you know, the brain doesn't get rid, the fact that we know about neurobiology doesn't get rid of free will. It just tells us that your free will and your free will may be very different. The parameters in which you're able to control your behavior differ because of your genetics and your environment. Uh, all of this is not exactly what you've been talking about tonight. I know I've heard a lot of rumors and stories, but never saw any research to the effect that people that smoke had less Alzheimer's than people that didn't smoke. Do you know anything about this? I do, actually. We've studied this. And Alzheimer's is um, a, bad, a bad example because it goes in every which way. And one of the reasons is that um, Alzheimer's uh, is more, uh, more likely when you have a lot of little mini strokes. And uh, nicotine and smoking can increase those mini strokes. Uh, on the other hand, nicotine does protect nerve cells that would otherwise die, and I was saying this earlier to some of my colleagues at a, a talk at um, NC State. And so the better association is actually with Parkinson's disease, where it's not so affected by these mini strokes, and there is good evidence that uh, smoking can, uh, over time, um, have a negative correlation with Parkinson's disease. Uh, so uh, for, our, for Alzheimer's, no, don't do it. <laughs> For Parkinson's disease, it may be that the nicotine in tobacco is uh, in some way effective, and so perhaps things like patch and other nicotinic medications may keep you from dying miserably from uh, lung cancer while not having Parkinson's. So at the end of your presentation, uh, you said the hope was to come up with a more targeted mm -hmm. uh, medication. Well, there's the patches and gum now. Yep. What's the difference between that, what you're suggesting, and what do you think of the current right. way? Another great question. So they may be good treatments for some things, right? So the patch, which is really just nicotine in its uh, more unadulterated un form, may be useful for things like uh, preventing Parkinson's disease or, in fact, even for things like depression. But in that family tree of 15 different subtypes of nicotine receptors, it's going to hit all of them because nicotine really is the prototype of molecules that hits the whole family. Since we can parse out the effects of different members of that family, let's say that we wanted to actually uh, develop a medication not for smokers, but for someone who struggles with obesity and who needs uh, another bit of help to uh, allow them to control their diet. Maybe we could imagine a more selective uh, nicotine-like molecule that would only pull out that subset that works on appetite. So the problem with uh, these receptors is that I've talked about them in the brain. I told you about the, um, the fight or flight response. They're also in your gut. They're also in your muscles. They're also even in um, immune cells like your, uh, your T cells. And so flooding your whole body with nicotine may have some good effects and some not so good effects. Perhaps we could pull out the better effects and separate them from, from the other effects and, and particularly things like addiction. But I don't, we, you know, we haven't gotten there yet. Marina. Hi. Um, you've answered this, or you've touched on this topic a couple of times, but I was listening to a Radio Lab podcast about addiction, and yeah. they actually uh, mentioned what you were talking about, about the Vietnam vets yeah. using heroin regularly. And I was hoping that you could just talk a little bit more about what it is about nicotine specifically that seems to make it so much more addictive mm -hmm. um, than what we would consider other okay. more dangerous substances and whether it's simply neurological okay. or social. Right. So there are a few things that uh, are wrapped up in that question. The first is something that I did touch on, so I'll just mention it briefly, which is that it, nicotine is very good at making those associations with the environment. Second is it's legal. And so what that meant for a long time is that people could smoke anywhere. And so those associations could be made with anything. So you might walk into a, a see a bus and want to smoke. One of the things that's interesting about the kinds of laws that now prevent smoking in restaurants, in bars, in a lot of public places, in, in hospitals, is that there are fewer places to have an association with smoking. 
So in, in an indirect way, I think that actually those laws have helped people quit by constraining where you can go and have the cues that induce relapse. So the other thing really is simply exposure. If you had, um, uh, if you asked this room, I think almost everybody has at least once tried alcohol, uh, unless you're under 21, in which case I am sure you have not. <laughs> the same is true for um, cigarettes, although that has declined quite a bit as, as people have understood how, how bad it is for your health. So that universal exposure means that if you have a susceptibility genes or a bad environment that make you more likely to get addicted to smoking and you don't, we're still gonna have a new smoker. If you're the only one who tries it and you have no susceptibility, you may try it and stop. So that universal exposure is why we have laws about youth smoking, why we have the, um, the prohibition against allowing people under um, 21 to buy cigarettes themselves because at that point, their brains are more likely to be susceptible to the nicotine and tobacco and they're, at, once they're exposed, you will find out whether or not they're gonna predict, pre, pre, bleh, go forward toward addiction. Okay, um, I have another receptor mm -hmm. <laughs> thought. Um, the reptilian brain seems to be where this is affected, as probably yes. all addictions, all drugs. And that is a very early stage of development of the human being. Mm -hmm. And is it possible that the drug of choice is because of a certain stressor mm -hmm. that happened at a very early age so that the internal uh, acetylcholine, and mm -hmm. other drugs were used so much mm -hmm. that it, it, the person has to have something to replace them. So I think that you have the germ of something that I believe very strongly in there, and that is that how early life experience stimulates these receptors or those brain areas or allows these circuits to be wired to that reptilian brain, which is so important for survival, and has really developed in order to have patterns of behavior that allow us to survive in a stressful world, a dangerous world, or a world without a lot of food. Um, I think all of that does in fact predispose some of us to having different signaling, particularly from acetylcholine, that may make us more likely to be addicted to nicotine if we're exposed to it later. But I also think that it doesn't really influence necessarily which drug you choose to be uh, or choose you end up addicted to. I think there are some uh, genes that uh, predispose uh, individuals to addiction to one substance, usually very close to the receptors for that substance, and others that are more broadly affecting the reward centers, the stress centers, that may predispose you to addictions of many kinds. And one thing that I should note about these nicotine receptors is that they are absolutely in the primitive brain and the reptilian brain, and they're also in the very modern cortical brain. And one of the reasons that people say they smoke is that it stimulates the cortex in a way that allows um, individuals who smoke to focus attention. So you have these pushes and pulls with nicotine. So I gathered that from your, your start that increased neuronal firing yes. was what nicotine is about for us. Yes. Speaking more broadly of addiction that may be other substances, and is it always about increasing neuronal firing or is it sometimes about decreasing? Uh, it is not always about increasing neuronal firing. And in fact, the, fa the, the observation that nicotine receptors generally stimulate the neurons on which they are found is um, somewhat um, protective because they can stimulate these reward centers, but they do also stimulate some of the inhibition onto those reward centers. So it's a mixed kind of thing. If you start with um, a system that's kind of quiet, the nicotine will increase the activity of that system. And if you start with a system that's really very active, nicotine, in fact, can decrease the activity, but indirectly. Drugs like opiates and cannabinoids, the uh, marijuana, actually work through receptors that largely silence the neurons on which they're found. But usually it seems to be through inhibition of an inhibition. So 
Although the receptors for cannabinoids, alcohol, opiates are inhibitory receptors, they inhibit nerve cells that generally quiet the brain. So you get this paradoxical increase in activity of the reward cells. Can you say anything um, about the way Chantix works and sure. the longevity of it? Like, does it, I mean, if people take it for a short time, but yeah. how long do those effects last? That's a great question. So what Chantix does, and it's a real uh, success story in terms of targeted medication development, is that those uh, nicotine receptors that are specifically in the reward center, you know, the beta-2 receptors, are the targets for Chantix. And the way that it was designed was to open those receptors a little, but not as much as nicotine. So the idea, it's called a partial agonist. It's just a pharmacology term. The idea is that you would tweak them enough to keep you from going into withdrawal and feeling really bad, but not enough to make you continue to want Chantix. And so that's, in theory, how it works. That's how it works in rodents, at least. In humans, it may be doing other things. But it also activates partially all of those nicotine receptors that we've talked about in other brain areas. And so it's kind of complicated. Some people say that it makes them just feel very strange or that it uh, gives them weird dreams. And presumably that's because it's working on the nicotine receptors that are in the other parts of the brain that you saw in that human brain slice. So how long do you need it? You presumably need it long enough to learn new behaviors. You need it to keep you from being so miserable from the initial withdrawal that you can learn the extinction, that you can learn that cues aren't going to predict that you smoke, and that you can find other ways to cope with those cravings. And then people usually uh, have a, a schedule to taper off the, the Chantix. Some people that I know um, who use nicotine gum uh, to control their nicotine cravings don't stop. And that is because those cravings are very difficult to uh, eliminate. And as I mentioned, you have to do new learning, and it's not going to erase the previous learning that makes you crave, crave the, the cigarettes. So I would say that um, if I were going to make a choice between chewing nicotine gum for the rest of my life or smoking for the rest of my life, I'd definitely go for the gum. I'm, I'm thinking of your interesting point about um, environmental cues that get associated um, with smoking and themselves lead the um, dopamine firing to um, enhance the craving yeah. for nicotine. Um, I read recently um, about research of over many years um, with Pavlovian conditioning um, that uh, seems in some cases um, to increase the efficacy of um, drugs with which um, it's the association is, is set up and may actually be able to replace the, the drug, maybe. Maybe. Any, anyway, yeah. I'm wondering if, if those two lines of research are um, consistent with one another or yes. um, if there are problems between them. Absolutely. Very consistent. And behavioral models of addiction um, are really predicated on the idea that you can uh, use Pavlovian models to model the initial learning to choose the drug and then uh, show how new learning in a Pavlovian model might replace the drug with a new kind of behavioral action. There's a really fascinating area of behavioral neuroscience that's called not extinction learning, which I told you was learning that an environment no longer predicts the drug, but instead something called reconsolidation. And let me explain what that means. Every time that we uh, use a memory, the idea from recon reconsolidation is not that we're simply recalling something that is over here, but it's like we go into a library and take out a book, look at it, and when we're done with it, we have to put it back on the shelf. And the idea in reconsolidation is that the molecules involved in recalling that memory and putting it back on the shelf are overlapping, although different, from the molecules that were used when you first learned that behavior. And so the idea is that you can maybe disrupt that memory, not just learn something new, but actually stop that book from being put back on the shelf with a treatment that interferes with reconsolidation. And that is um, controversial in humans. It's not entirely clear that it will, will work. 
But for example, in post-traumatic stress disorder, which is thought to be really overactive fear learning, the idea is that if you relive that fear and you have blockers, the parts of the, the neurotransmitters involved in the stress-related memory, that you might in fact be able to prevent that reconsolidation. And the same ideas may be um, also applicable to drug addiction. Still under, dis, uh, under study. I used to be a heavy smoker, and I quit cold turkey on my own. Good for you. And, but I've heard, and other people are having the same experience um, that you really hate cigarette smoking, mm -hmm. you're really sensitive to it, yeah. and uh, absolutely find it disgusting. Yeah. So uh, is that a phenomenon that other people experience too? Well, certainly my stepfather had that too, and he'd yell at anybody who smoked near him after he quit, which is interesting. I think that there are a couple of things involved there. So while you're actively smoking, you are actually uh, quite potently inhibiting your olfactory system, your sense of smell, and your uh, gustatory system, your sense of taste. So while the nicotine, or while you're smoking, you actually aren't tasting the cigarettes the same way that you would as a completely new smoker. And so it may simply be the contrast between that subtle uh, smell and taste you had of the cigarettes while you were smoking compared to that really harsh, overwhelming smell that happens when your nose has actually come back to full functioning. Uh, a lot of people um, certainly report that the, the smell of, of cigarettes becomes disgusting, but maybe uh, if it were far away enough and that there was a, a hint, good, I'm glad. The other thing that people report completely non-related to your question, but one thing that uh, a couple of women have said to me is that they know when they're pregnant because they smell tobacco smoke and it is absolutely repellent. And as you all know, uh, when you are pregnant, there are evolutionary uh, mechanisms that protect the fetus from toxins in the environment. And so in fact, uh, women who are pregnant often get more sensitive to bitter, which usually protects uh, something toxic. And uh, some, some women report that they just find uh, the, the smell of tobacco absolutely repellent. Hi. Hi. I would like to get a quick insight into vape <laughs> sticks. Because it's the last question. And uh, okay. I know vape sticks, if you're yeah. familiar with it. Yeah, it's absolutely. It's sweeping across Europe and yeah. replacing smoking yes. by the second. I have never seen anything take off as quickly as vaping. Um, uh, you know, five years ago, I had never heard of it. Now, if you cannot work, walk past a convenience store without signs for all of the different vape pens and so on. So vaping is uh, very interesting in that it is, in theory, a uh, delivery of nicotine that doesn't have some of the other com constituents of tobacco. You should know also it has, uh, and it's not burned. Right? It's in, in a uh, volatile form in steam rather than in the burned tobacco. The thing about vaping is that um, there are a lot of other things in there, like formaldehyde, flavorants, the cinnametaldehydes, I think, which are uh, apparently pretty nasty. So we have maybe a few decades before we find out whether vaping is good or bad. Uh, I'm reserving judgment. I don't know either way. But one thing I am worried about is the fact that now I have a colleague who works with adolescents. She goes into the schools, and one of the huge public health successes that we've had is to go from 60 to 65% of people who smoked, most of whom said, oh, it's just a habit, to less than 20% of people who smoke, and the understanding of most adolescents that it really can kill you. So what she's finding is that the uh, attitude toward smoking, as well as to nicotine in general, is shifting among adolescents. And because nicotine gets absorbed in different places and has different effects on the brain, vaping is still not as good as cigarette smoke at getting that real high, that the, the addictive um, properties of nicotine. The best is really getting it straight to your brain really fast. And smoking, unfortunately, is a very good way to do that. And so what many adolescents do is that they start with vaping and they become dual users. So they vape uh, in most places, and then if there is an availability of smoking, it's in some way getting the nicotine to the brain more effectively. And so now the idea that it's less dangerous and that you kind of like the nicotine could lead us actually to reversing some of the public health benefits of the last few decades. And that, that worries me.
uh, <clears throat> Marina, this has been a lot of fun and really interesting, a lot of good stuff. I want to ask you just a couple wrap-up questions. And, uh, but, but actually, one, I'm curious about Wellbutrin. Mm -hmm. Wellbutrin is, I guess, is it classified as an antidepressant? Mm -hmm. um, so I've heard for a lot of people, it's been a really effective. Mm -hmm. The best example, my mom, after a stroke, she had been a lifetime couple packs a day smoker. She had a stroke that actually had other effects on her. It was bad. <clears throat> but they put her on Wellbutrin. And she's in the hospital. But after that, that's it. There was one time she asked my dad for a cigarette, and she hated The taste of it offended her, and that was it. Yep. She never smoked again yep. after decades of being a heavy smoker. So what is it about Wellbutrin in particular? So that's a very, very interesting question. So uh, one thing is that it is an antidepressant, and the association between depression and smoking is very strong. But not every antidepressant does what Wellbutrin, Wellbutrin does. One thing we know is that Wellbutrin does block nicotine receptors. <laughs> it also... Increase. So all you get is the taste. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but not, nothing positive. It also increases dopamine. But what's very interesting about the discovery that Wellbutrin is good for smoking is that it was completely accidental. It was developed as an antidepressant. People were using it and still use it for depression. And it was prescribed, and people would come into their doctor's office and say, funniest thing happened, doc. I didn't feel like smoking anymore. And it happened enough that, in fact, there was this uh, observation, and it began to be studied. And sure enough, it was not just uh, a, a side thing. It was a central property of Wellbutrin to actually decrease the craving and to help people who may have wanted to quit already just stop. And is there something about, so there are so many things, bad habits. Some of them are drugs. Some of them are just other kinds of habits that we have trouble shaking. And it seems of all of them, uh, nicotine has this thing where even years later, mm -hmm. even after you think you broke the habit, decades later, mm -hmm. people seem to say, I've never smoked cigarettes, yeah. so I'm, but from everything I've heard, is like this is one that even decades later, they're still susceptible right. to being sucked back into it. Right. it so is there something... I mean, yeah. most of those drugs probably yeah. use the same dopamine receptors. So, so let, right? let me... Um, Step back a little bit. First of all, the, uh, we use habit as if it were something that's benign or something that's different from uh, addiction, which is bad. Habit is the action of parts of your brain that make you do things unconsciously because you've done them again and again and again. And of course, what we have habit for is so we can free up parts of our brain to think about stuff while we do automatic things. And sure enough, what habit is, is like addiction. Right? You start something like you smell the cigarette, and the next thing you know it's in your hand. You didn't even know it happened. So imagine this. This is uh, what habit is. You go home every day in your car to the same place. You go, you've got your route. Start thinking about your day. You start thinking about your kids. One day you have to drop off your dry cleaning. You've got it. You're going home. Next thing you know, you're in your driveway. The dry cleaning is still in the back seat. Right? That's habit. That's because you did not need to use conscious control to carry out that behavior. That's also addiction. So the other thing I would say that's a little bit um, different from what you mentioned is that people who have cocaine addiction, people who are heroin abusers, remember it decades later. Yeah, okay. Addiction <laughs> is a very, very powerful illness. Um, let's look at Robert Downey Jr. Let's look at um, many of the celebrities who have a lot of good things going on in their lives they stay clean for a long period of time, and all of a sudden something happens in their lives. Either they are with someone who uses that drug, which is a cue related to the drug, or something very stressful happens in their life, and the next thing you know, they're back in the newspaper because they're addicted. So it is not specific to nicotine addiction. And as I mentioned before, what may be different about nicotine is that it's legal. So all of those cues actually are around us much more often than perhaps the cues with illegal drugs. Excellent. So we've covered so much stuff. What do you want us to leave here knowing? Is there something, uh, anything you haven't said or anything you want to sum up and leave us with? Nope. <laughs> well, it's been really interesting. I think we all learned. Yes, exactly. Nice round of applause for uh, Marina Pachotto. And um, I have one request. 
for everyone that's sitting that grabbed chairs uh, that are not the normal chairs out here, could you please do us a great favor and fold them up and bring them back here? It will uh, save, if you all help, it'll save a couple people a, a lot of trouble. Uh, so next week is the Science Spelling Bee. And uh, then after that, more Science Cafe. So how about a nice round of applause for Dr. Marina Pachotto? And thank you very much. Great questions, everybody. See you next time.